Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second day of the third Asia Clean Air Partnership Joint Forum. My name is Sephora Goetze, and I'll be your host and moderator for the following session. Titled Mon Multiple Benefits of Action, Climate and Clean Air, I hope that the conversations had by our speakers today, the information provided, and the data presented in this session will demonstrate the potential benefits of implementing integrated actions for clean air and climate. I would like to extend my gratitude and recognize the invaluable assistance of our partners, Climate and Clean Air Coalition, CCAC, the Institute of Global Environmental Strategies, IGS, the Stockholm Environment Institute, sorry, SEI, and the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, IIASA. Before we begin our fireside chat, I would like to invite Mr. Toshiyuki Yamasaki, who's the Director of International Cooperation in the Air and Water Quality Management from the Ministry of Environment, Japan, in his welcoming remarks. Hi, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Toshiyuki Yamasaki. I'm happy to have this opportunity to deliver a welcome remark to you all, who represent one of the policy makers, researchers, representatives of relevant organizations, as well as the audience from all over the world. For the very important topic, build back better for healthy air, healthy planet. The theme of this session is multiple benefit of action, climate, and uh, clean air. Co-benefit uh, co of clean air action and climate action is one of the key policies that Ministry of the Environment Japan has been working on for more than 10 years. We recognize that the need for the co-benefits approach has become the most highlighted topic ever before due to the serious consequence of climate change happening more frequent and the global pandemic of COVID-19. Air pollution issue has long been well recognized in the Asian region, including Japan yet. It's an ongoing common issue that requires urgent action. Today, Researchers and government officials, mainly in Asian region, will share the current situation, issues, and future directions of each country. Through these, it will showcase important issues and matters to be solved in the Asian region in order to gain the multiple benefits and right directions. I wish that this session will be a useful source for every participant for tackling the major and urgent challenges of climate change and air pollution in the Asian region and other regions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Yamasaki. The verdict is out and the science is quite conclusive. All major air pollutants pollutants have an impact on climate and most share common sources with greenhouse gases. This relationship is inextricably linked. So what are the actions that states, cities and governments need to take to reduce emissions of these pollutants, not just to counter the effects of climate change, but to also protect human health and even boost things like crop yields? Let's watch this video on the need for multiple benefit pathways and more integrated solutions. Our atmosphere protects us. We all depend upon it. Every year, we continue to pollute it. Climate change and air pollution are closely linked. They are now the world's greatest environmental threat. Our emissions have already warmed the planet by one degree Celsius. Air pollution kills more than seven million people each year and makes our planet less habitable. These impacts threaten development, ecosystems, food, and water security. The Paris Agreement gave us an ambitious target to keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, while also meeting our broader sustainable development and poverty eradication goal. To achieve these goals, we must reduce all climate forces from long-lived gases like CO2 to short-lived climate pollutants like methane, black carbon, HFCs, and other air pollutants. 
there are many choices to make, but the path that we choose is just as important as reaching the target itself. Some paths are too dangerous, like delaying action and allowing air pollution to continue unabated, risking passing irreversible climate tipping points. But by acting fast and integrating climate and air quality strategies, we can deliver real-world benefits for human health, agriculture, and the climate. This multiple benefits pathway can also help us achieve the sustainable development goals. The IPCC tells us that the actions we take in the next decade are critical. The best news is that there are ready to go and proven solutions that we can do right now. And that can help put us on a sustainable path to 1.5 degrees Celsius, such as using mass transit and low sulfur fuel, green freight, and suit-free vehicles, improving household energy through better lighting and cooking, improving collection, separation, and disposal of waste, capturing methane from landfills for energy production, reducing methane leaks in the production and transport of fossil fuels, promoting sustainable agricultural practices, supporting energy-efficient clean cooling technologies with the phase-down of HFC refrigerants, and fostering international collaboration. By working together, we can raise our collective ambition. With integrated solutions that maximize benefits for climate change, clean air, and sustainable development. Save millions of lives and make the goals of the Paris Agreement a reality. The decisions we make today will bring results that last generation. So let's do it. What a very informative video, especially for someone like me, who's a complete lay person. So let's start things off with a fireside chat to explore this topic of multiple benefits of action. I'm joined today by three scientists who have agreed to lend their expertise on the gains that can be made when integrated actions for clean air and climate are implemented. Joining us today is Dr. Zbigniew Klimont, who is currently research group leader and principal research scholar for the Pollution Management Research Group, Energy, Climate and Environment over IIASA. He leads the development of models to estimate emissions and mitigation costs of ammonia, NMVOC and particulate matter. Next is Dr. Johan koylen a research leader at SEI. Dr. Johan's key areas of interest relate to atmospheric issues, including air pollutants and climate change. His focus is on the linkages between climate and air quality, especially those associated with strategies to reduce short-lived climate pollutants, otherwise known as SLCPs. Finally, our third guest is Dr. Eric Sussman. Dr. Zussman is a senior policy research um, and area leader at the Institute for Global Environmental Studies in Hayama, Japan. For most of the past two decades, he has conducted research on environmental issues in Asia. Welcome everyone. As someone who comes into discussion with a layman's knowledge of dis and discourse around clean air, air pollution and climate, I'd like to encourage each of you to assist not just me, but the viewers at home in understanding um, the following. So what are the policy and clean air technology measures that can be used to tackle this issue? What are the benefits that you've witnessed in your line of work? And also what are some of the actions needed to take on by governments on a local, national and regional level? Um, I leave the floor open to all of you to have this discussion. Thank you. Let me start. I'm going to go first. Why don't you go first, Dick? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, I, will, I will start with saying, just giving a few examples, uh, just of you, as you asked, to put us on the, on the same page. And many of us are, are fully aware of the, um, the standards that are introduced, for example, emission standards for vehicles. This is some of the most common things when we talk about policies that would address air pollution, but also climate. If we think about energy efficiency standards that would bring reduction of uh, CO2 uh, emissions. We have uh, emission standards that have been successfully introduced in many of the countries that address pollution from stacks, from industry, from power plants and industrial sources. But there's also a number of measures that are very important that are more of a management type 
that have been also illustrated in the video. And uh, we need to think about sharing guidelines and experience across uh, region, uh, any region actually, about these actions and, and requirements on, for example, how to manage our landfills, how to improve efficiency in, in agriculture. Agriculture is one of the sectors that is worth highlighting, uh, playing a very important role in mitigation of climate change, and that has been already highlighted very often, but we tend to forget about the role of agriculture also in formation of particulate matter, and, and there is an increasing role in improving efficiency in agriculture, mitigating emissions of ammonia that are, are very important. In terms of uh, technology, that is uh, just to say a word about the technology and, and highlight few technologies that are important. I would like to say just one word. It repeats a little bit what was on the video, but what we breathe is not what we emit it uh, very often. A lot of species that are put in the atmosphere from cars, from stacks, from agriculture, like ammonia, are not really the ones that we directly then breathe and we are concerned about PM 2.5. PM 2.5 in the atmosphere is a mixture of primarily emitted PM 2.5, think about black carbon or dust. Black carbon is also relevant for climate, as we saw, and, uh, and then pollutants that are gases and turn into particles. And they play both an important role in formation of PM 2.5, and they play also a role in, in climate. So they affect also uh, climate. And these technologies, uh, why, I'm, why I'm saying that is that as you saw also in the video, sources produce both greenhouse gases and air pollutants. So it's a cocktail of pollution that is being produced by sources. This cocktail varies from source to source. Some of them would be emitting just one pollutant who would be dominated by one pollutant, like agriculture that would be dominated by ammonia and by methane. And many other sources, when you burn something, produce a lot of different pollutants. Technologies, on the other hand, and not on the other hand, but technologies also reduce the cocktail of pollutants at different efficiencies. So it's important to understand these efficiencies of different technologies. Think about a filter on, on a stack that could remove primary particulate matter, say dust or ash or black carbon also. On the other hand, a catalyst in a car will be reducing a mixture of, uh, of pollutants. And we have this knowledge in the models that we are running to calculate the uh, reduction of different species and effectively translate that into a change in the atmosphere, what we breathe. That is then having positive impact on health reduction or improving our health, which is something that we calculate as a, as a benefit of this action. Maybe I'll stop here and come back to benefits from the model in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, Dr. Johan, um, I'm sure yeah. very interested in understanding the linkages between like climate and air quality. Um, could you explain that for like me and the viewers at home as well, please? Yes, well, there are quite a lot of linkages. In fact, they are so linked, these two issues, that they really shouldn't be addressed separately. But that is the normal way of um, that, that countries are, are addressing these things, although increasingly, <laughs> They're, they're trying to look for integrated solutions. So we've seen from what Zig has said and also from the video that, you know, one of the reasons why they're so linked is that the same sources give rise to the greenhouse gases um, and the short-lived climate pollutants that are responsible for climate change, but also the air pollutants. So, you know, there isn't, it's, it's possible to address both emissions at the same time. On the other hand, you know, because, you know, these, these issues are dealt with in, in silos often, there are some options, um, you know, policy options and technical options, which, for example, only address the air pollution um, and doesn't make any difference to, to the, the CO2, for example. So, you know, there are different solutions and some of them will address both and some only address one of the issues. And... So only by having an integrated approach can you kind of look at the, um, the implications of different policies and measures for both air pollution and climate change. So, you know, we need to find 
the solutions um, with multiple benefits, you know. So um, there are things which will address air pollution and, and climate change together, but also the solutions to these problems can also help with other development priorities as well, not just um, those two issues. I mean, if we look, for example, at transport, if I could give an example, um, <clears throat> we can move to electric mobility, and this will reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we did some analysis in, in Chile, uh, which showed that, you know, if the electricity to run these cars is produced from fossil fuels, then the, the emissions from the power stations remain, and there isn't, there's little change in the CO2, and then you're shifting the, the source of emission from the car to the power station. But if you go for the renewable energy, so you need to then sort of link these things together, then you get some real benefits in terms of climate change and air pollution and reducing the burden of air pollution in, in, um, in the cities where people live. Um, and there's another thing I heard yesterday when I was listening to a talk, um, then if you invest in renewable energy, for example, when you're coming out of COVID and investing lots of money, you create three times more jobs in developing more new renewable um, technologies than with fossil fuels. So, you know, there's a big, there are lots of other benefits as well of going to renewables. Um, so, you know, we can create jobs, reduce air pollution and climate change, but you still get congestion. You still got traffic jams, you know, if you've got electric cars, you still got traffic jams. So then you can look at other options, you know, you can design cities. So you reduce the need to travel by putting, you know, where people live and where people work closer together. Um, and you can promote um, walking and cycling and public transport, and that will reduce congestion. And walking and cycling increases the health of the population and reduces the emissions of air pollution, climate change. So you've got all these wins, you know, and we really need to be able to understand, you know, when we are going to address these problems, how can we get the biggest bang for the buck? You know, where can we get the biggest um, benefits, the most benefits for the investment that we make? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm just curious, um, Dr. Zussman, how does this correlate with the, your basically two decades of knowledge and research in Asia as a whole? Yeah, yeah thanks for that question. And, and let me feed a little bit off of uh, the points that uh, Johan were raising, was raising. Um, I think it's really important when um, we talk about the, the multiple benefits that of course we try to aim for uh, benefits for air quality, benefits for climate change, uh, benefits for health, of course, um, but then to, to link into what Johan was saying, I think it's also increasingly important that we think about some of these social benefits. And let me give a, a very concrete example of work that we've done in the past that helps to uh, harness some of these social benefits. So in the past, we've done work where we've tried to introduce and promote uh, clean cook stoves in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is a, a very big uh, solution that has uh, impacts, of course, on uh, air quality, um, has impacts on uh, near-term climate change, and to some extent also long-term climate change, has huge impacts on health. Um, and then some of the biggest impacts, of course, are uh, in terms of uh, gender and gender equity, because uh, women tend to be uh, um, the segments of society that are most exposed to uh, air pollution from uh, indoor cooking. And by improving their health, then you can also achieve other benefits, for instance, for um, education, um, uh, for social equity. Um, so there's a lot of positive uh, spillovers that uh, exist out there. And I think um, when we talk about multiple benefits, I think one of the things we want to consider this is sort of implied in the idea of these pathways, but, but thinking a lot in terms of streams of benefits and how do we bring together streams of benefits in ways that can promote things that are, are good on multiple dimensions of development. So that gender issue is one of them. Um, the other side of the coin though, that I'd like to suggest, especially from a policy perspective, and as we think about trying to capture these streams of benefits is 
not everything that we do that's good for air quality and climate change is always going to have uh, positive impacts on uh, on certain social aspects that we care about. So, I mean, one of the big things that we've talked a lot about in uh, in Asia context is uh, uh, coal-fired power plants and uh, movement away from coal. And uh, I think, of course, this is vitally important. I can recall, you know, maybe 20 years ago when I first started to, to do research on air pollution in China, I went to a city called uh, Taiyuan, which at the time was the most uh, polluted city in the world, at least according to calculations 20 years ago. And uh, when you would run through the streets of Taiyuan, I mean, you would literally uh, get covered in uh, soot and, and uh, charcoal. Um, and I would remember talking to policymakers in Taiyuan and asking them, okay, well, it's so obvious here that this is having huge impacts on people's health. You know, why not switch away from coal? Um, and uh, at that time, there was consideration of natural gas. So why not switch fuels here? And the, the big issue, of course, is, is jobs. And so, um, you know, people losing jobs, especially in places that depend heavily on industries um, that produce air pollution, this is a big challenge for us. So I think from a, you know, a policy research perspective, uh, two things we need to do is one, we need to think in terms of streams of benefits and especially bringing in the social benefits, extending to gender, education, many of the things that are covered by what we call the SDGs. But at the same time, we also need to think about some of these potential social trade-offs and we need to package our policies in a way that will help to minimize some of those trade-offs and facilitate transitions to you know, futures that have clean energy involved, of course, um, but also point us in a direction where we can achieve more benefits. And I, it's, I think it's impossible to eliminate losers from this equation, but to, to, to minimize those losses. So, so those are some thoughts that I'd like to share. It's not only a multiple benefit story, um, but it's a packaging of policy story. Um, and we need to think in also about some of the costs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you all, but actually also ask you, because you have all this wealth of knowledge, right? Um, but it's also important for others to kind of understand in like a succinct way from each of you, from your various angles, um, what you think the key actions that are needed, like the urgent actions that are need to be taken in this region now. Um, I'll start with Dr. Clement, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I, I will start with saying what the benefits of these actions are uh, and then highlight some of those that are most important. We, I would like to refer to the WHO World Health Organization guidelines for air quality and for PM 2.5 for the small particles in the air. They, they recommend 10 micrograms. Just wanted to put that number, that's the air quality guideline that we strive to achieve. It's not a regulation, but it's a goal for many of us. And it's um, not achieved across large uh, area in, on the, in the world, actually not only Asia, it's the same in, in Europe. And there's another guideline that is an interim target, which is 35 micrograms, which is commonly used or very often in many countries, that's the regulation, national regulation. I would like to highlight that according to the calculations we've performed for the ASEAN region, about uh, 200 people, 200 million people, sorry, are currently uh, breathing clean air, what is perceived as a clean air, fitting the 10 micrograms, while um, over 400 million are exposed to high level of PM 2.5. And actually about 100 million is well above the 35 micrograms. The measures that we propose in the report, forthcoming report and in the assessment, could reduce air pollution and climate gases as well, would bring a significant benefit and more than double the population that would breathe clean air within 10 micrograms. So that would mean about 500 million people from about 200 that we estimate now and also in the baseline following current legislation. If we implement current laws, there's a lot of very good regulations already but that's far from being enough to protect us from, uh, from um, poor air in the, in the future. So about 75% of uh, PM2.5 exposure could be actually reduced introducing all of this measure by 2030, of which about a third 
is, could be or should be reduced with existing laws and legislation. And this is, let me highlight two most important sectors and areas where this should be achieved. It's been already achieved to some extent, but we have to push further and make sure that there is enforcement of legislation. This is power sector and industry. These are different filters reducing PM 2.5, SO2, improving efficiency of these plants, reducing also uh, CO2. And, uh, and then policies in transportation. These have been already delivering and they could bring benefits in order of 30% of the whole potential. And the rest remaining measures, we have to focus on strengthening some of the standards in these sectors, but more importantly, introduce action in sectors like clean cooking, for example, LPG stoves, waste management. Waste sector came up as an important sector, much more important than we had in some of our previous estimates. And this is actually cutting across both greenhouse gases, methane, and air pollution, reducing burning of trash. But it's not as simple as that, saying stop burning trash. It's much more about a system measure that would employ collection of waste, separation of waste, recycling of waste, proper storing of waste on landfills, properly operating them, that would bring benefits and recovery of gas from these landfills that could replace some of the dirty fuels also for various uh, purposes. And lastly, I would like to highlight agriculture. Again, like in the very beginning, I mentioned that. Here we have a plethora of measures that are not yet well understood in many countries because the experience with introducing these measures is not so vast as, for example, various filters in power sector. And so we have measures that could address ammonia emissions from agriculture, from livestock production, as well as mineral fertilizer application on cropland, but also measures related to behavioral changes. Johan was hinting to that and, and Eric also. And in this case, one thing could be think about what we eat, think about our diets. These measures are consistent also with, I believe at the end of this uh, session, Drew will be commenting on probably on, on the, on the uh, global methane assessment. So these measures that we suggest proposed here and that come out of our modeling are consistent with what is proposed, what came out of the modeling for the global methane assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Johan, um, would you have, like something to add to that as well, please? Yes, I mean, it's, it's going to obviously be a similar sort of message that um, Zig has given us. So um, one thing to emphasize is that we do know how to do the air pollution bit. It's been successfully reduced by, you know, some emissions, some, some pollutants are reduced by 90% um, in, in Europe and North America. And, and so um, and what we really need is for the capacity to build in all the nations in, in Southeast Asia, the capacity to be able to do this integrated analysis. So we need uh, uh, people to be able to develop scenarios which can show how different policies and measures affect emissions and how these um, affect human health and climate change and also um, the other benefits. So, you know, this process has been successful in many parts of the world, but it's not everywhere and it needs to be more integrated. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is um, we don't have to wait for everything. There are some obvious things that we can do. Um, fossil fuels are the cause of, you know, uh, most of climate change and also a large proportion of air pollutants. And we really need to get out of fossil fuels. And um, one of the things in the global methane assessment that was mentioned is that we really need to stop investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so the second is to sort out the agriculture. And as Zig was saying, it's really the link between healthy diets. You know, there are lots of benefits of, of people in richer countries having healthier diets with less beef, for example, um, which will have a big impact on um, also on the, the emissions of greenhouse gases and air pollutants. So um, we need to understand those linkages between diets and agricultural production and, and use agricultural production methods that 
um, will lead to lower emissions. And then there's two other things. One is clean cooking. So, you know, it's a massive impact on human health from indoor exposure. And as Zig uh, emphasized as well, we, we really should be sorting this out. You know, stop burning biomass um, and, you know, sort of move to cleaner fuels so that the poorest in society aren't so exposed to air pollutants. Um, and then, you know, we need to deal with waste and waste management. So those are some, some key issues. So process and then get on with some obvious uh, measures. And, and, and you know, it, there are some success stories out there that we can use to sort of leverage action. Um, but we need to really integrate air pollution and climate change together. It just doesn't make sense to treat them as separate issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Zisman? Yeah, I'm going to hit upon uh, three points, basically. Is, uh, if I was explaining this to um, uh, my parents on, on what they should do to try to help us uh, deal with uh, air pollution and climate change in Asia. Um, so the, the first thing, it's uh, not so obvious, but is uh, actually really important, is to work uh, on what we call inspection and maintenance programs for vehicles. So um, in a lot of uh, countries, uh, developing countries, um, especially uh, the older vehicles um, uh, might be a very small proportion of the vehicle population, but they can be responsible for upwards of 50% of uh, the emissions from the transport sector. Um, so trying to set up ways that we can create incentives for people that uh, use older vehicles to get them repaired um, that's a, a real challenge, but something I think that can deliver a, a lot of benefits for both uh, air pollution and uh, climate change. Um, so that's uh, something that's uh, relatively narrow, but uh, really important. And I think, you know, in this context, actually, the city of Tokyo, Japan, has had some experience with their diesel inspection and maintenance program, and that could be shared um, uh, throughout the region. Um, the second uh, area that uh, I would uh, like to highlight uh, once again, uh, speaking to, uh, to my parents, is um, that uh, it's uh, really important to think about how air pollution gets integrated into climate policies. So one of the things that, you know, we're looking at as we um, uh, think about uh, this uh, big meeting in Glasgow, the COP meeting in Glasgow, COP26, is countries are updating what they call their nationally determined contributions. These are basically uh, a list of pledged actions that countries are taking to both mitigate and then also um, build resilience to climate change. Um, and these things are getting a lot of attention from uh, high level policymakers and politicians. Um, and we're seeing some good evidence of countries putting air pollution into these climate uh, pledges. Um, and that, with that comes, you know, uh, re more resources and, um, and uh, more uh, political support. And so, for instance, in, if you look at the NDC from Vietnam within uh, ASEAN, there's a lot of links to not only air quality co-benefits, but also some of the other social benefits I mentioned. So there's some good examples out there, and I think this is something we should encourage more countries to do. Um, and uh, SEI has, has done some good work in the space trying to promote this integration. The last thing I'd like to highlight, and it, it, it's closely... Uh, uh, it, it's similar to the previous suggestion, is that we need to think about this is not only about making good policy, but also good politics. Um, and I think in translating some of the science, um, uh, of course, it's good to have scientifically informed policy and the, the work that YASA and SEI does in this space um, is, is amazing in that regard. Um, and uh, I think one of the next steps is to set up the know, institutional arrangements within countries so that, you know, we're going to talk to uh, colleagues from Thailand in just a bit. And, you know, one of the things we want to try to do to help Thailand and other countries in this region is take the scientifically informed policies and then say, okay, to the politicians, the folks that, uh, you know, are um, a lot of times controlling the purse strings, controlling how resources are allocated, are taking these policies and putting them in a place where the politicians cannot ignore them. And sometimes that involves communicating with, you know, civil society groups. Sometimes that it involves um, uh, communicating uh, with the media, 
but uh, a lot of times it also it means that we need to make a stronger link between the policymaking institutions and the legislators or the diets that make a lot of the key decisions on who gets resources, when, where, and how. So this good politics, good policy linkage needs to be strengthened. And I think the multiple benefits story can help in that regard. Thank you very much. And, and Zipro, before, there's one thing I, I missed, which I think is very important in Southeast Asia, and that is that regional cooperation can be really powerful. You know, both because air pollutants don't respect national boundaries, and so you have a shared problem. Uh, and so it makes sense to talk to each other about how to, to solve it. And, and secondly, people can learn from each other. They have similar problems, similar sources, and they can share solutions. And so there's a real opportunity in Southeast Asia for the countries to collaborate much more closely together, learn from each other and, and deal with these problems, these joint problems more quickly and, and lead to better development in the future. And since Johan forgot something, I, I've also forgotten something. Well, I remembered now something that I, I think it's worthwhile stressing. We, we tend to talk about future policies and further mitigation potential, but it's so important not to forget about the success of actions that have been already implemented and policies that are in place. We, in our models and discussions, we always take it for granted or often take it for granted that policies that are in place will deliver, but we have to really make sure they deliver. Somewhere between 20 to 60% of the overall mitigation potential that we've been estimating in, in during the model link is due to policies that are already in place. There's good experience. I think Eric has been highlighting that and Johan as well, both on the technology and policy uh, area. We have to make sure that they deliver. We have means of doing it, and this is an important message, I think, to take home as well. We have to follow that up, enforce it, and, and at the same time, change, uh, face the challenges, how to deliver on, on this future integration. Thank you. Thank you all. I definitely did learn quite a lot um, today in this session. Um, so we'll move on to the next um, part. And I'm honored to invite Mr. Takahashi Yasuo, who's the executive director at IGES. And prior to joining IGES, Mr. Takahashi held key positions at the Ministry of Environment of Japan, including as vice minister for global environmental affairs. Mr. Takahashi, lovely to meet you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, attend this uh, panel discussion and uh, make uh, a moderation. Uh, actually, I attended the second APCAP joint forum in Bangkok uh, in 2018. So we, this week we have a uh, we had we are having the third joint forum in a totally different setting because of the COVID-19. But uh, we are very happy to have a chance to discuss. Uh, the, this critical issue of air pollution and uh, to uh, share uh, experiences and uh, enhance our regional cooperation. So uh, uh, for our discussion today, we, are, we have esteemed panelists from across the region who will highlight uh, examples of successful implementation of an integrated approach at the national level and how this has contributed to national priorities and identify opportunities to support of these clean air solutions in Southeast Asia. So uh, our first speaker is uh, Ms. Heidika Jamsheid, a climate change specialist from the Minister of, of Climate Change, Pakistan. And also joining us the, is Ms. Uh, Shawaporong Rangsharong, a director of Transboundary Air Pollution, Pollution Control Department, Thailand. And the third uh, panelist is Mr. Uh, Shandam, Shandat Him, Deputy Director, Air Quality and Noise Management, General, uh, General Directorate of Environmental Protection, Ministry of Environment, Cambodia. And finally, we have Mr. Francois Carcel, a Southeast Asia Transport Task Team Leader, uh, Agence Frances to Development. So thank you very much for all uh, joining us today. So I would like to, uh, first I would like to invite uh, Ms. James Hyde from uh, Pakistan. Uh, to share her experiences. So I have three uh, questions for each panelist. So for uh, Ms. Uh, Jamshead, 
uh, first question is how is Pakistan integrating reduction of short-lived uh, climate pollutants in national air quality plants? And second, what are the benefits you have seen uh, because of using an integrated approach for climate and clean air? And third question is what are the key aspects you are focusing on to move forward and how can regional cooperation support? So uh, Ms. Jamshide, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction and it's an honor to be sharing a panel with such esteemed uh, panelists. I will be uh, uh, answering your all three questions collectively uh, in a manner that you are, they, they are answered together. And just to give you a background, Pakistan uh, is uh, one of the top 10 countries most vulnerable to climate change. And we are in, these, uh, in this top 10 for the past 20 years. Uh, this is due to the number of uh, disasters event uh, Pakistan has faced. And uh, also uh, 10, around 10,000 life, uh, lives were lost due to these uh, disasters. And uh, if you look at it from the economic point of view, uh, almost 4 billion USD uh, losses were incurred. So this makes Pakistan as, as, as puts Pakistan on one of the most vulnerable position. And on top of that, there's a burden of air pollution as well, which individually uh, from the air pollution, uh, there's an annual loss of around 65 billion uh, rupees. And this, uh, this loss, uh, the health loss is equal to 6% of the GDP of Pakistan. And if you look at from the life expectancy uh, uh, level, uh, if, uh, if, if, we, if we take the data of PM 2.5 uh, above the WHO level, uh, uh, the uh, average uh, reduction of uh, a Pakistani uh, life expectancy is around 2.7 years. So this, uh, uh, and on top of that, there is an issue of uh, food security as well, uh, and air pollution, uh, especially the ozone uh, pollutants, which is also a short lived pollutant, uh, reduce the crop yield uh, from 35 to 46%, depending on, and then again, there is an economic uh, loss in good because of this. And in the winter season, there, there is a problem of smog as well, which is coming in two months as well. And uh, this just, it, it, smog is not a, it's, the problem is not just the visibility, but also the dangerous uh, health uh, impacts it has on, on, on the population of Pakistan. And all of this is worsening the, uh, worsening the impacts of climate change and the environment with the rapid urbanization uh, we are facing in Pakistan. Around 37% of the people are residing in urban areas and uh, soon Pakistan will be the most urbanized uh, country in South Asia. And this urbanization is not just creating a problem of creating more green jobs, but it is also creating a problem of uh, urban air pollution a problem of waste management congestion and uh, these are some significant uh, environmental issues which we, uh, which Pakistan has to deal with and also uh, with that uh, currently there is a 6% annual increase of uh, GHG emissions and we, uh, from the baseline it is expected that the emissions will increase by fourfold by 2030 where 46% is by energy sector and 43% is by agriculture sector. So realizing uh, all these issues, realizing all the challenges we are facing, uh, the government of Pakistan uh, is uh, is very much uh, committed towards this and realizing that they are in my, we need to have environmental sustainability uh, in the heart of all the initiatives we are taking. And uh, they, they are setting goals for adaptation and mitigation very specifically. And so, uh, some of the initiatives I will be mentioning, uh, uh, which will uh, uh, which will focus on uh, climate change and cross-cutting with air pollution, which uh, the current government is taking in Pakistan. Uh, as transportation remains one of the major issues, uh, one of the major causes of air pollution, uh, Pakistan developed an uh, electric vehicle policy back in 2019. Uh, the goal is to reduce the emissions. A uh, goal is to uh, achieve 30% uh, of EVs by 2030. Then there's another initiative which was launched by Prime Minister Imran Khan, Clean Green Pakistan Initiative. It focuses on sustainable cities. Uh, the main components which, uh, which are under this initiative is waste management, sanitation, hygiene, urban forestry to uh, for curbing uh, urban air pollution uh, problem in, in the cities. Uh, this, uh, this initiative is implemented in all the provinces and the regions of Pakistan. And uh, it's, it deals with at the local level, at the district level, so that they, uh, there's a uh, 
uh, bottom up approach can be used uh, to deal with uh, the issues of climate change and air pollution. Then we have a successful initiative of Bricklin initiative, uh, where the main focus is on short lived climate pollutants, especially the black carbon. And uh, currently, uh, we have achieved 100% uh, Bricklin. Uh, converted to zigzag technology in Punjab, which was a big achievement. Uh, 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 recently, we also introduced the Euro 5 fuel, which further enhances the environmental performance of the vehicles and reduce the emissions and the environmental impacts. Then I would say the feather in the cap and uh, the flagship event of Pakistan, the 10 billion tsunami tree project is uh, one of the major uh, initiatives which we are taking. And uh, we planted uh, one uh, a billion tree on the World Environment Day back in June this year. And we plan to plant the, in, another billion by, by the end of this year. This is not just focusing on the plantation of the, uh, of the trees, uh, which is the main goal, but the co-benefits uh, out of this project is to create green jobs after the COVID-19 pandemic. On Almost 100,000 jobs has been created already under this project, uh, which are green. And, uh, uh, and recently, la last month, Prime Minister Imran Khan launched the uh, world largest uh, Miyawaki uh, Urban Forest Initiative in Lahore, which is the most polluted city of Pakistan. Then coming over, I, I've heard the uh, discussion before uh, before me and they were discussing about NDCs and how Vietnam has also uh, reflected uh, air pollution in their NDCs. Pakistan is also revising their NDCs and we plan to reflect air pollution in our uh, in our revised NDCs. We, we have taken two uh, two steps for that. We, we have done a co-benefit study with WHO, uh, which focus on how uh, air pollution can be a co-benefit uh, if we focus on the climate change mitigation. Then uh, we also... Uh, uh, ha we also have a policy brief developed uh, uh, in collaboration with ADB uh, uh, to, to have uh, to see how uh, air pollution can be cross cutting for the NDCs of Pakistan as well. Uh, we, we are also in the in the formulation of Pakistan Clean Air Program. Uh, this program, the main aim is uh, to develop a roadmap for future interventions related to air quality management. And uh, in this under this program, the, we are going phase wise approach, phase one, phase two, phase three, and the focus is on data collection and to uh, and to deal with uh, uh, short lived climate pollutants. But I will. Come, come to the main uh, uh, project recently started uh, with the funding of CCAC uh, with the uh, Stockholm Institute and Clean Air Asia. The government of Pakistan started this prob uh, problem to uh, uh, project to reduce the short-lived uh, climate pollutants in Pakistan by strengthening the capacity uh, of the partners uh, and training them on the LEAP IBC tool and encouraging uh, encouraging them to develop a LEAP IBC tool indigenously and locally so that every province can uh, uh, every province can focus on that and uh, this is basically the development or intervention of air pollution mitigation at the national and the provincial level is the main goal so that we can focus it uh, more holistically and you can see from these all initiatives, we, we do realize and we are very much aware that uh, air pollution is a cross-cutting issue when we're dealing with climate change. And it should not be uh, dealt uh, in silos. One, one question you asked in the, the second question about the benefits. The benefit is that we are looking at all the issues more collectively, more holistically. And we are using more of a whole of government approach to uh, keep all the stakeholders in, in, in the processes of uh, implementation and development of plans and to keep all the issues cross-cutting. Gender was mentioned. We, we, are, we are focusing on that part as well, not looking at in isolation, but looking at in more cross-cutting way. Youth is there, then there's an issue of wash, uh, other initi initiatives, which are usually not given that much priority. So this, this is something we are focusing on. Pakistan Clean Air Program is, uh, will be published soon. And NDCs will be, uh, Pakistan NDCs will be out soon. We are also revising Pakistan uh, climate change policy. So all these policy documents are focusing on air pollution and we want to show the great commitment. And as I've mentioned two projects which are taken up personally by the Prime Minister Imran Khan. So it's not just technically, uh, but we also have a very good political buy-in right now for all these issues. And we do realize that a lot of uh, initiatives needs to be taken if we want uh, to deal with this issue. So concluding, not taking a lot of your time to conclude my remarks, uh, the, we need to realize that the problem of air pollution is interlinked with climate change, mainly because the activities that emit air, uh, air pollutants are also the uh, emitting, they're also emitting GHG emissions as well. And uh, the, uh, 
the major focus is on the fair phasing out of fossil fuel from the energy sector but uh, but that alone cannot uh, solve the problem of air pollution uh, when we talk about uh, it specifically we need additional activities when it comes to agriculture based burning open based burning solid based burning and also uh, focusing on hfc gases which we are focusing on currently there are two three projects going on reflecting in our revised ndcs as well so just my last remark that uh, clean air is a debt we owe to our next generation and uh, we need to make sure that we need uh, we take significant actions and we take significant uh, we, we implement significant, uh, significant programs so that the next generations are with acceptable ranges of air pollution and uh, from pakistan uh, i would say that pakistan is looking to adopt a phase out approach to curb air pollution and mitigate greenhouse ga- uh, gases uh, collectively thank you uh oh, thank you very much uh, mr jam said uh, for your very uh, comprehensive and uh, uh, informative uh, presentations and uh, uh, i feel a very strong will for for your country to tackle this important issue So on to the next uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Shuapon Rung Yanong uh, from uh, Thailand. And I, I have three questions for you. Uh, one is, uh, first one is how has the climate and air quality policy in Thailand evolved in the last few years? And second, how can we strengthen efforts to reduce short-lived climate pollutants in Thailand and in the Southeast Asia region overall? And then, uh, based on the preliminary results of the study of ASEAN, what are potential challenges to implement the recommendations, solutions, recommended solutions? So, Ms. Shwaporang Rang Yanon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon to you all. And it's just my great honor to speak today. Um, actually, for Thailand, we have been working to cope air pollution for decades. To date, the air pollution situation in Thailand is much improved. The success story for us is the reduction of lead, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and total suspended particulate. But unfortunately, we still have unfinished business that is the PM 2.5. In response to this, the Royal Thai government has adopted national agenda for particulate matters in particular and endorsed action plan to prevent and solve it. The action plan is approved by the cabinet and assigned to all relevant ministries to carry out. Furthermore, we develop a hot plan each year to be in line with current situation. After action review or AAR is also conducted every year. After the PM situation ends, so then we have uh, the data information up to date. We know how to improve our measure and strategies. And of course, our plan does not cover only Thailand, but our region, because we realize that air pollution is transboundary. Then we need to control the problem in our country to not be a problem in our region. I would have to say that uh, Thailand very much concerns and gives high priority on a multi-benefit approach, which integrate national air quality management, energy management, and of course, climate change mitigation. With that, Thailand has become a partner to the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, CCAC, in 2019 because we would very much like to reduce short-lived climate pollutants or SLCP, especially black carbon, that is one of component in uh, PM 2.5, that's the biggest problem in Thailand and our region now. The CCAC uh, is, one, is one of my hope, uh, is an important mechanism to reduce SLCP in Thailand and in ASEAN. Even if it is a quite new network for us, we, we still need to uh, learn about CCAC and try to work with uh, this network because we just be the member just a couple of years. But I strongly believe that working through this will help strengthen our abilities 
Thailand has joined a cross-cutting area of assessment initiative to build upon the CCAC available existing regional assessment design to generate the nationally targeted data and information on black carbon for mitigation opportunities that can accelerate emission reductions for black carbon caused by open burning vehicles, industrial and other sources at the city, national, as well as regional level. The output of the initiative black carbon assessment will support the review of mitigation measures in the national action plan. I would like once again to emphasize that air pollution and climate change are the top priority concerns at regional and global level, which prove that no single country can solve this problem alone, but requires stronger collaboration. Then I would like to encourage ASEAN to attach higher emphasis on beating air pollution and SLCPs. Even though controlling or finding the best general solution is of course difficult, but it is the goal that society must try to achieve. We ASEAN could join hands again, like we have done for ASEAN agreement on transboundary haze pollution. This is very good agreement in our region. We can apply our cooperative spirit, experiences, and lesson learned to address this challenge successfully. I know that time is short. Then ASEAN countries should come together and bring to attention our consideration for the strengthening and enhancing in the framework in the area of air pollution, SLCPs, and climate change. Several issues should be addressed and mitigation should be implemented urgently, including capacity building, management, as well as environmental education and technology transfer. We also require a wide range of knowledge. We need to upgrade our abilities and skills by learning and exchanging with other organizations, countries, and regions. To achieve this, I would encourage ASEAN to consider three things. First, intensifying efforts and further strengthen actions and measures to control air pollution and SLCP sources. Second, utilizing existing cooperation mechanism to exchange best practices and share knowledge and information on air pollution and SLCP control management. And third, strengthening the aspiration to reduce health effects from air pollution and SLCP. In terms of activities, I would suggest six activities that are first monitoring, because monitoring is the starting point for successful of management program. Then we should upgrade and expand our monitoring network in our region. Second, standard. We need to set up and strengthen the current standard based on country situation. We could set our, you know, ultimate goal, but we could have timeline different in each country. Third, control a source, which covering mobile sources, coil sources, and area sources. Fourth, improving management by targeting air pollution and SLCPs reductions, decentralizing management, updating of emission inventories strengthening enforcement, expanding health effects studies, applying economic instruments, improving interagency coordination, building capacity of national, local, and people institutions, and expanding local government role. Fifth, broadening public participation by increasing public participation, responsibility, and willingness to contribute on an individual level to reduce pollution, not only awareness, improving the effectiveness of information dissemination to, gen to generate public and political support for actions, strengthening public disclosure programs to encourage better pollutant behavior 
and implementing public outreach program. Last but not least, harnessing global opportunities for local air quality improvement and SLCPs, of course. ASEAN should have more cooperation between countries and with development agencies, including the bilateral cooperation to exchange best practices and share knowledge and information on air pollution and SLCP's control management. I will end my uh, remarks today by making a statement that I did at the ENS Awareness Workshop just on Monday this week that partnership is key to achieve healthy air, healthy planet, and raise ensure that Thailand stands ready to work with our stakeholders, our country, our region, at our level for good health and well-being of our society. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shapon Long Xian Long. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, very informative presentation and stressing the importance of the uh, regional cooperation among ASEAN countries. And also you suggested many uh, various concrete uh, policy proposals. Thank you very much. And then I would like to move to the third panelist, uh, Mr. Shandatu Him uh, from Cambodia. So I have three questions for you. First, can you briefly introduce the Clean Air Plan for Cambodia? What are the, its key objectives and how can it help protect people's health and at the same time contribute to the climate action? Second, what are the priority as areas that Cambodia wants to target in the near, in near term? What support does MO, Minister of Environment need to address these areas? And then uh, Cambodia completed an update to its NDCs last year and referenced core benefits on climate action and the SDGs progress. Understanding the in intention of Cambodia, what are the, the current biggest obstacles? So, uh, Mr. Chandis, Chandas Him, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Takahashi. Uh, thank you for having me in this uh, panel discussions. I'm Chandas from Cambodia. Talking about a uh, clean air plan of Cambodia, it is a very important document to illustrate the status of air pollution control in Cambodia, sharing uh, some similarity to other developing countries, a gradual increase in demand for mobility, power products, housing, and so on, occurs through uh, country, gradual increase in demand and occurs through the journey to the development and this lead to the increase of emission. So the, the Clean Air Plan of Cambodia outlines some key aspects, including air quality status, legal document and management program, emission by sector, as well as the mitigation measure scenario and the estimated benefit of action. Clean Air Plan of Cambodia have incorporated several measures for effective monitoring, assessment, control of air pollution in Cambodia. The approach for expanding implementation under Clean Air Plan Cambodia is through main streaming and integration into the existing policy and program of the government of Cambodia, which is a significant step forward identifying science-based policy decisions with uh, regards to managing air quality in Cambodia. So I, I do hope that this information uh, will uh, serve as a important source of uh, data and information as well as an overview to support planner, policy maker and researchers and uh, civil society academy to work hard together in order that good air quality is ensured along the development. So uh, for developing the Clean Air Plan Cambodia, there are uh, several objectives. So first one, to develop an integrated analysis of air pollutant, greenhouse gas, and salt, uh, climate pollutant to identify the major source sector of air pollutant currently and how they are likely to change in the future. 
and to identify mitigation measures in existing plans and strategy that will be effective at reducing air pollution uh, emission while simultaneously mitigating a greenhouse gas emission. And uh, third one, to identify uh, the multi multiple benefits of the identified mitigation measure for improving air quality and mitigation climate change. Uh, uh, the last one, but not least, uh, to prioritize action and pave the way for coordinating air quality management in Cambodia. So according to the finding, several air pollutant and uh, salt climate pollutant have common sources. Therefore, designing a mitigation strategies have the potential to lead to the simultaneous reduction of uh, multiple pollutant and also greenhouse gas like methane and carbon dioxide. Let me uh, uh, explain about how impact uh, for implementing a clean air plan in Cambodia. It was estimated uh, to uh, reduce uh, population weight uh, for PM2.5 concentration by uh, 4 microgram per cubic meter in uh, 2030 compared to baseline through implement the uh, clean air plan uh, mitigation measure. So this reduction in PM2.5 concentration across Cambodia could avoid almost uh, nine, 900 uh, premature deaths per year and 15% uh, uh, of total health burden from uh, air pollution and uh, around 57% uh, of health burden caused by emission uh, from um, Cambodia itself through uh, leaf IBC. I think the signal is f freezing, no? I'm afraid that we've lost uh, Mr. No, Him. I'm afraid the uh, Signal is, I cannot see and hear. Perhaps we can move on to Mr. Francois and ask him uh, a question. Shall we, move to the, uh, shall we move to the next speaker? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, because of the uh, technical trouble, I would like to move on to the uh, last speaker, Mr. Uh, Francois Kasser from, uh, from uh, AFD. So uh, I have three questions for you. Uh, what uh, support can AFD provide to help Southeast Asia address air pollution? The second is what recent actions through AFD partnerships have been the most successful in the region? How do you intend to re replicate them? The third question is what uh, are some of the key lessons learned AFD has collected from its experience supporting actions that have co-benefits from integrated approaches to climate and air quality. So Mr. Francois Kassel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Takahashi, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Francois Kassel. Uh, I'm a transport specialist, but also in charge of uh, air quality operation within AFD, uh, the French Development Agency. AFD is a bilateral development agency for France, for those who do not know us. And we fund and, and support transition towards more sustainable development. Uh, historically, we've been working with Southeast Asian countries since the 90s to support sustainable growth in many sectors that actually contribute to air pollution reduction growth, such as uh, sustainable mobility, improved waste management, sustainable rural development. And as a development agency, uh, we are well aware that the consequences of air pollution impact primarily low and middle income countries, 
where around 90% of fatalities related to air pollution occurs. And it affects primarily the most vulnerable population. So to contribute to address this challenge, AFD seek to support partner countries through its range of financial tools at different levels. It can be at the project level with investment loan at policy level to support policy elaboration with technical assistance. And basically the AFD approach for air quality uh, follows the main pillars of a good policy for air quality. So we try to contribute to a greater awareness of the air quality issues to better knowledge and monitoring, <clears throat> also to build uh, capacities locally and to prepare investment projects or policy reforms that leads to a concrete reduction of air pollution. In the region, we've been developing in partnership with the ASEAN a joint program to support Southeast Asian countries in their efforts to achieve better air quality. It was recently presented during the last ASEAN working group on environmental and sustainable cities with a great interest from member countries. Actually, this regional program aim to support both local and national government in the region uh, to support policy elaboration, build capacity, raise awareness, also share experience throughout the region. And we've seen in the uh, past speech that it's very important. And finally, to develop studies that can prepare projects in, in sectors that contribute to air pollution reduction. Uh, we've discussed that transportation may be a key sector such as waste or agriculture. Um, so the second question was, uh, what action AFD have been uh, conducting successfully in the region? Um, so first, it's important to say that we do not have that many uh, projects or programs historically that have been dedicated primarily or only to air quality. The main driver or focus of operation uh, was not this, but it is now becoming a really strong element of our strategy and dialogue with our partner countries in the region. In my opinion, uh, the most interesting success story we can showcase is in Vietnam uh, with Hanoi City. So back in uh, 2017, uh, the concern regarding air pollution we are raising both among the population, but also within governments and Hanoi City requested support from AFD. They were eager to learn from the French experience. So we organized several workshops and trainings uh, with Air Paris, which is a Paris air quality observatory on air quality management. And we support the design of the monitoring network for the city. Based on this fruitful collaboration, a more comprehensive program was developed with a grant from AFD to provide further technical assistance to Hanoi City to prepare a sustainable investment program for the city with the key objective to reduce air pollution. This includes investment in air quality monitoring system, but also some project of clean bus of improved waste management, for example. This program is being developed with a clear will to integrate uh, both climate change and air quality approaches with targeted sector and projects that bring substantial co-benefits on both dimensions. So this approach developed with Hanoi, starting with first experience sharing, capacity building to go then towards policy dialogue and more substantial investment is what we intend to replicate uh, in the region through the regional programs that we are just starting. And I think that the, the, the last question was regarding lesson learned uh, from our experience in the sector uh, regarding integrated approaches. So I would say that from our past and ongoing action in uh, air quality sector, uh, I see a, a few takeaways from our perspective. That is the perspective of a, of a development agency. So we, both, we all know that for climate and air quality, uh, impacts and solution has to be sought at both local and global scale. So in our work and operation, it means concretely that we need to try to better articulate our dialogue and project with both national and local partners, but also to articulate strongly our support at both policy and project level. Depending of the country context, maturity of air quality policies, we shall be able as AFD, as a development agency to propose a consistent offer to our partners 
to support further improvement uh, at policy level, but also at sectorial level with projects. A second takeaway, and I think it was uh, mentioned in the introduction in the discussion is regarding institutional arrangement and coordination. Uh, we all know that climate change and air quality are very uh, multidimensional and multi-sectorial issues. So it is very important to engage earlier dialogue and set up proper coordination mechanism to involve all relevant stakeholder institution, uh, not only uh, Ministry of Environment or Pollution Department, but also sectorial agency, local agency that manage, for example, uh, energy or industry, transport, waste, actually the one who deals with the operation and policy implementation. It was stressed, and I believe it's very important that it's good to elaborate sound and ambitious policy, but it's very important to, to pay an attention of uh, how we achieve a great policy implementation. Uh, third takeaway is the data. Um, we know that both air quality and climate change uh, lack often proper and updated data. So for air quality, for example, uh, updated emission inventory, and it is very important for us to include uh, assessment and data collection in early stages of project preparation. Not only to inform uh, the policy and decision making, but also to be able to conduct a proper evaluation process and to monitor if we adequately reach the expected impacts. This requires resources, both uh, human and financial. And now in our uh, project appraisal process at AFD, we try to systematically assess potential co-benefits of both climate change, but now also air quality in order to target only projects that brings multiple co-benefits. And uh, last takeaway uh, to conclude my speech is regarding the uh, capacity building. So dealing with uh, issues such as uh, air quality, climate change in an integrated manner is relatively new and it requires long-term efforts that goes beyond just a project life cycle. So it's important to train to empower uh, local partners so they are able to follow up uh, policies and projects, but also to use uh, some tools that are developed uh, on their own, such as air quality monitoring system or be able to perform or update emission inventory and so on. So again, it requires resources, but uh, it is a long-term investment that is really needed if we want to make a change. So I will stop here. I hope I was not too long and thank you again for your attention. Uh, sorry, I, I <laughs> for uh, 10, or 11, 10 or 20 seconds, I, I lost my uh, signal. Sorry, I... No worries. So, um, Kasa, you finished? Um, yes. we, we actually, we've only got 15, finish, uh, 15 minutes left. So I'll just um, transfer back to um, Mr. Takahashi. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, uh, because of the time constraint, I have to uh, summarize this uh, session, I, I believe. So unfortunately, uh, because of the technical uh, trouble, uh, I miss uh, last part of the presentation of Mr. Kandas Him, but I, I, I clearly recognize the, the, how the Clean Air Plan in, in Cambodia played an important role in the in their policy uh, development. So anyway, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, four uh, distinguished uh, panelists uh, for sharing their uh, experience uh, from the, the, your respective countries and organizations. And we have a very informative uh, and interesting discussion today. So I, I, I of course, I, I, I cannot uh, summarize the, the presentations, but I would like to try to pick up some of the key points uh, in, in the discussions. Uh, first, I think everyone stressed the importance of integration. 
Uh, so uh, and, uh, in Southeast region has the potential to yield massive benefits from implementing integrated solutions to air pollution and climate change. And uh, everyone uh, stressed the importance uh, of uh, the high priority of, of both uh, air pollution and climate change. And second, uh, the, the key to achieving these benefits, core benefits is uh, first of all, uh, strengthening the enforcement of existing industry, energy, and uh, transport uh, policies. Uh, but also, the many people, many panelists stress the importance of other sectors, including including waste management and uh, uh, waste management and also agriculture uh, to uh, enhance this uh, integrated approach. And thirdly, uh, it is also stressed that the importance of uh, regional cooperation in ASEAN, uh, South Asia countries, including ASEAN, uh, to uh, uh, strengthen the capacities of uh, enforcement capacities uh, of each country. And as also, it is also uh, the regional cooperation is very important to uh, share uh, innovative solutions and innovative experiences among uh, countries. And finally, uh, many, uh, many of the efforts will deliver significant uh, benefits, not only for air quality and climate change, but also uh, more broad uh, uh, benefits uh, to uh, enhance uh, regional sustainable development, including social benefits and, and uh, uh, improving the the, the uh, economy, so uh, it is. It's this is my uh, takeaways from the the very valuable presentations. So uh, I look forward to continuing. Uh, we look forward to continuing uh, this kind of discussion uh, to further enhance our uh, our. Uh, uh, if, uh, experience sharing, experience sharings and uh, cooperation. So uh, let me uh, uh, now uh, hand it over to our uh, MP, Zippo, Zipra, uh, for the next part of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Takahashi, and a big thank you to all our speakers today. Um, I think it's, I can speak for everyone when I say it was fascinating to hear from such esteemed regional experts, um, basically sharing their concrete policy proposals, ideas, and research and findings. Now I'd like to introduce our final speaker who will deliver our closing address, and that's Mr. Drew Shindell. Mr. Shindell is the current chair of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, and that's CCAC, the Scientific Advisory Panel. He's a professor of climate science at the Nicholas School of Environment at Duke University. Drew, over to you. Thank you, Tsipora. And I second your comments that it was fascinating to hear all of these comments from our distinguished boat panels. Um, I guess when I'm, I'm left in the, in the same boat as Mr. Takahashi just was and being unable to effectively summarize such a um, fact-filled and content-rich uh, discussion, but uh, uh, several things occurred to me. And one of them is, is, you know, I'm from the United States and our president has been talking about a whole of government approach uh, to tackling climate. And, and, I, and that's one thread that really ran through this is to me is that is the way there are multiple levels and multiple actors involved. And so we need to have work done at all levels. We need to communicate benefits. We need to understand technical measures. We need to get all the way down, as Francois Carcel noted, down to get providing the detailed emission inventories for countries where those are lacking. And then we need to kind of work all the way up, as Eric was talking about, Eric Sussman, about how we need to communicate to the policy makers. And, and a lot of times we have to do that by engaging with civil society or engaging with the media. And there's, there has to be some way to bring the, or some leverage to policymakers to really get them to prioritize this. And that's precisely because the range of actions that have to be put into place are so large. So that was another thread that really ran through this that I, I thought was really fascinating, was that we have to focus on 
less conventional, perhaps, sectors. We, have, we really have to pay attention to waste and agriculture. Uh, Zig fr from Yasa was pointing out the role of agriculture not only in a short-lived climate pollutant like methane, but also in particulate pollution. And the waste sector is clearly an important one, if we both for the methane that comes out of landfills and for burning of trash. And, and yet we can't neglect power and transport and industry as well. And sometimes there are even surprises lurking there such as the outsized role of older vehicles within the transportation sector, which are important to target, even though they're small in numbers, and the outsized role now that we have orbiting satellites that can see gas and oil sector leaks from space, we're seeing that those are enormous from some parts of the fossil fuel industry, including uh, within Myanmar, apparently, which was news to me when I saw the data, uh, as well as places you'd expect with large oil and gas infrastructure like Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and such. So we, we really need a full, I would echo my president, a full, full of, whole of government approach. We need to tackle all these different parts of the economy. And as was pointed out, I think very effectively, this, this is not just an issue of the environment, but it, there's a clearly one of the things that is most important is providing information on health benefits. Those that convey, uh, connect to the public quite well. Uh, it was good to hear things like the quantification of benefits from Cambodia, that their new policies would give 900 prevented premature deaths per year. It's good to see that Pakistan, for example, was putting those kind of benefits into their NDCs even. And so we need, we need that kind of, of quantification. We need the environmental part. We need also, as again was emphasized, and I think really is critical, we need to deliver on these. So, you know, it's been well um, observed and well noted that the NDCs pledged by countries are insufficient to meet climate targets. And yet at the same time, our actions on the ground have largely been insufficient to even meet the NDCs in much of the world. And so we need to deliver on pledges, both for climate and for air quality. But at the same time, we heard a lot of, of discussion about how this is also a social issue. We, we can't just talk about health and climate and environmental concerns, but we really have to take into account things like jobs and minimizing the social trade-offs because inevitably there will be winners and losers. And while there may be a, a, a large uh, difference in the number of people, in general, public health benefits will accrue to the entire population uh, when action is taken, whereas uh, the losers will be a small segment of the population, but that segment can be powerful. And that segment is certainly going to feel the impacts uh, much more strongly. So we really need to concentrate on showing policymakers how to minimize trade-offs with the losers. And at the same time, we have to highlight the social benefits, gender equality, education, using, can you imagine a future where we, we power m many of our electric uh, activities by landfill gas rather than dirty coal. So there's a lot of optimism in this. Making it happen is challenging, but there's, I think, a lot to look forward to. And I can envision a future where we have tackled climate and clean air in Asia. And as Zig noted, double the number of people in Asia breathing clean air with, with our current technology, eventually even better. We're on the right track. And I encourage countries to join our movement to reduce methane that's gaining strength right now worldwide, as well as to tackle air pollution locally. Thank you for having me and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Back to you, Tibora. Thank you so much, Juru, for those positive words. And thank you to everyone for attending today's session and also to our speakers for lending their expertise and knowledge. I hope that we can continue these conversations on the multiple benefits of action and actually take action. Um, I know that I've learned a lot and I hope that you have too. And don't leave. I would like to direct you all to the next session, which is going to be on youth and clean air for blue skies. Thank you all for joining us today and let's keep the conversation going. Bye-bye.